I'm Gabrielle Lassard, Health Policy Attorney with NILC, the National Immigration Law Center. Thank you for joining us for NILC's first virtual convening. The goal of this convening is to begin a public-private dialogue about innovative strategies for providing health care to low-income immigrants and other people who remain uninsured after the full implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Over 300 people will be joining us for today's session. So unsurprisingly, your phones are on mute. You will be able to ask questions using the webinar menu on the right side of the screen. Our format is to have three 15-minute presentations from our four panelists and then to devote the remaining time to Q&A. We'll try to respond to as many questions as we can. And for those people who missed out, the session is being recorded and will be available on the webinar section of our website at NILF.org. I want to thank our funder, the Blue Shield Foundation of California, and give special thanks to our panelists, Daniel Lewis, the Associate Director of the Division of Eligibility Policy at Healthcare Policy and Research Administration in the Department of Healthcare Finance in the Government of the District of Columbia. John Jarenko, the Senior Assistant Vice President of Intergovernmental Relations with the New York City Health and Hospital Corporation. Tandering Brigham, the Director of Managed Care at the Los Angeles County Department of Health Services. And Bethabel Estudio, Health Policy Coordinator for the California Immigrant Policy Center. We will begin with Danielle. All right. Okay, so I've prepared some slides that I wanted to walk through with the group. And first, I would like to thank Gabrielle for reaching out and giving me the opportunity to share information about the DC Alliance and Immigrant Children's Program with all of you. All right, so we can get started to the next slide. Can you advance this slide? Okay, great. So the presentation today, we're going to provide an overview of eligibility requirements for the DC Healthcare Alliance Program, application submission, accessing healthcare coverage, renewing coverage for Alliance. Also, I wanted to walk through our Immigrant Children's Program and provide an overview for the eligibility requirements, application submission processing, accessing health care coverage, as well as renewing eligibility for this program. Next slide. So what is the DC Healthcare Alliance program? It is a locally funded program that covers individuals who are not eligible for Medicaid. Our current enrollment is 14,454 beneficiaries. It is a locally funded program, 100% local funds. There's no Medicaid funding associated with this program. And it provides comprehensive health care coverage, which includes doctor visits, preventive care, prenatal care, prescription drug coverage, lab services, and hospitalization. Next slide. I wanted to highlight a few of the services that are not covered in our DC Healthcare Alliance program, and that includes vision care, mental and behavioral health, in which we partner with our Department on Behavioral Health Services, and anyone, any district resident can access services, which includes mental health, behavioral health, substance abuse treatment, um, non-emergency transportation services, the Alliance program will cover emergency transportation, and I just wanted to highlight those important services. You can advance the slide. Okay. So what are the eligibility requirements for the DC Healthcare Alliance program? You must be a district resident. You must be at least 21 or older. Your income cannot exceed 200% of the FPL, and we also have a asset test where your resources cannot be over $4,000 for an individual or $6,000 for a couple or a family. You cannot be eligible for Medicaid and you cannot be eligible for any third-party insurance. 
And I wanted to note that U.S. citizenship or eligible immigration status or qualified immigration status is not a condition of eligibility for the Alliance program. Need advance? Okay. So just in dollars and cents, when you say 200% of poverty, what does that mean to the average person? So you can be an individual, a household of one, and have income up to $1,945 and eligible for this program. Also, if you're employed, we have a $100 earned income disregard. So technically, you can have income slightly over $2,000 a month and still be eligible for the Alliance program. And let's say you're a household of three, so let's say you have a mom, dad, and a child, you could have income up to $3,298 a month and be eligible for this program. Next slide. Okay, so I just so a person would submit an application. It's a combined application for Medicaid benefits as well as SNAP, which is food stamps or TANA, and you're screened first for Medicaid eligibility. If you're ineligible for Medicaid, then you would be screened for Alliance coverage. If you are determined eligible based on and it's primarily immigration status. The Alliance program requires a face-to-face -face interview, and if you have any outstanding verifications, you would receive a notice to provide those verifications. DC, our agency that's responsible for determining eligibility, our Department of Human Services, has 45 days to make that eligibility determination. For in that time, coverage will begin starting the first day of the month of application, so if you apply on June 30th, coverage will start June 1st. And individuals are not eligible for retroactive, medi um, retroactive coverage, which is available in the Medicaid program. All right, we can advance the slide. All right, and access to health care coverage. So if you're eligible for the Alliance program, you are automatically assigned to a managed care organization. If you have 90 days to transfer your med a managed care plan, if you do not like the one that you are automatically assigned to, and if good costs exist, then you may transfer after those 90 days. I wanted to also note that there's no cost sharing or any fees for an alliance beneficiary. Providers would never charge and should never charge for any services or prescriptions. And then I've listed our MCOs in the District of Columbia, which is AmeriHealth, Trusted Health, MedStar Family Choice. You may advance. Okay. And just the high level of the renewal process, if you are determined eligible for Alliance coverage in order to continue to receive coverage, you must renew your benefits every six months. You will receive a notice in the mail 90 days prior to the end of that certification period to complete the renewal form and to schedule your face-to-face -face interview. That is a requirement at initial application and at renewal. If you need to provide supporting documentation, then you would turn that in when you turn in your renewal form. Once your face-to-face -face interview is completed, then we will determine your eligibility to see if you still meet all of the eligibility factors. And if you do, you'll be renewed for another six months. Okay? And that's a high level. So that's our DC Alliance program. I wanted to talk to you all about our Immigrant Children's Program, so you can advance the slide. Okay, so that's a program for children up to age 21 who are not eligible for Medicaid in the District of Columbia. Our current enrollment is 2,347 beneficiaries. This is a 100% locally funded program similar to the Alliance program, and our, our services are identical to Medicaid with the exception of the fee-for-service provision. So if a child required long-term care services for more than 30 days, the Alliance program would not cover those services. But we cover physician services, dental care, vision, eyeglasses, 
pharmacy, very similar to the Medicaid program. Okay, we can advance the slide. All right, and so for the eligibility factors for our Immigrant Children's Program, you must be a district resident under the age of 21, have income under, and not, not just the child's income, because we know that children have no income or very limited income, but we're using the scheming rules that would apply to Medicaid, so if a parent's income would count towards the child's eligibility for our Immigrant Children's Program, the income threshold is 200% of poverty. There's no resource test and U.S. citizenship or eligible immigration status are not conditions of eligibility for this program. May I advance the slide? And just, I'll give a quick example. If you are a parent and you have uh, two children in the household, you can have income up to three, $3,298 and be eligible for this program, your child would be eligible. Okay, you can advance. All right, and the application submission process would be, of course, if a parent would submit the application, the district has 45 days to make a determination. We use the income deeming rules that are used for the Medicaid program. We're talking about pre-ACA, and also coverage, if determined eligible will begin at the beginning of the month of application. You may advance. All right. And then it's very similar to our alliance program where children are auto-assigned a managed care plan. The parents have 90 days to change that plan. And after 90 days, if there's good cause, they may change at any time. They're the same managed care plans, but I did want to highlight that our um, health services for children with special needs, which is the fourth managed care plan, specifically, um, it's a structured plan specifically for children who are disabled or medically fragile and need additional supports and services. Okay, you may advance. Okay, and the renewal process for immigrant children, so it's a 12-month renewal period, Sorry. excuse me, and 90 days prior, you will send out the certification notice. There's no face-to-face -face requirement for our immigrant children's program. Um, the parents would complete the renewal form, provide supporting documentation. If the child is still eligible for this program, we would determine their eligibility for the next year. All right. Next slide. And that's my contact information if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danielle. Let me just switch up the slide here, and then we will be hearing from John Drinko. John wasn't able to get a webcam for today, so we will just look at him. Looking cool in the subway. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Now, uh, um, our our web access is kind of spotty here in New York, which is ironic. Um, normally, we're in you know, Silicon Alley, but today it's not working so great. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say today is similar in some aspects to what Danielle just talked about, and there are some key differences I want to go over. Uh, but before I begin, um, I want to thank everybody for coming, and I want to thank everybody for the opportunity um, provided by uh, the National Immigration Law Center. This is a great and very timely discussion today. Um, just a little bit of background about HHC. I don't know how much everybody knows about us. We're the largest single, single largest municipal health care system in the country. We've got 11 acute care hospitals, five long-term care facilities, six diagnostic and treatment centers. Uh, 75 community-based clinics, uh, certified home health agency, managed affiliations with all New York, major New York City medical schools, and we have 36,000-plus employees. Um, just to give you a sense of how much care we provide, uh, we see more than a million patients each year. Uh, unfortunately, about last calendar year, about 490,000 of them were uninsured, so a very big number of our patients are uninsured. 
and of the ones that are underinsured, the there's going to be a good chunk of that that are not going to be, you know that are not covered at all under the ACA. Among hospitals in New York, we provide about 70% of all the uninsured patient uh, outpatient care. Um, 43% of uh, emergency room visits for what we consider treat and release. 36% of behavioral health admissions in New York City are HHC facilities. Uh, a quarter of the city's trauma cases, a quarter of the newborns, a quarter of the AIDS admissions, and a quarter of the substance abuse admissions in New York City are provided at HHC hospitals. Um, 1.2 million emergency department visits, 5 million outpatient visits per year. So. We're, we're fairly big, fairly large. We see a very diverse uh, patient population and um, very happy to be here today. This is, as I said before, very timely. We have a, a new president at HHC and in New York we just got a Medicaid waiver so there's a lot of opportunity that's going to be out there that we're going to be working on in the coming months. Our new president, um, Dr. Ram Raju, comes to us from Chicago after having you know, been there for a couple of years, he was with us before. One of his goals, his visions, is to further increase access and further reduce disparities in New York City. Um, he really wants to make it easier for people to access care in their communities and expand beyond the hospital walls, so to speak. We've got a lot of clinics uh, around the city and we want to break out of that hospital-centric care frame of mind that uh, all too often pervades us here in New York. Um, with the ACA and the expansions that um, were offered by that, we signed up about 90,000 people in our health plan, Metro Plus, um, which is great, uh, but we're still going to have a lot of people who are ultimately not going to be eligible. Um, and I'm going to talk about our HHC options program in a minute, which is similar to what Danielle was talking about with the DC Alliance program. Um, in New York, with our Medicaid waiver, the, most of the focus is going to be on delivery system reform. And we, of the $8 billion that New York is going to receive, $6 billion plus is going to be focused on delivery system reform. The main goals uh, that the state set forth are to increase access, improve care coordination, and focus on care management. Um, we have identified more than 100 uh, potential partners that we're going to work with. The state's requiring folks to work with each other, that hospitals can no longer continue to operate in isolation. We have to work across lines and across systems to expand care, uh, make sure that we cover everybody. Um, we're going to work closely with folks in our communities and with community-based organizations. That We've had a long history in New York of working with uh, folks in the community, sort of at a grassroots level to get the word out that folks can come to us. We serve everybody regardless of their ability to pay, regardless of their insurance status, regardless of their immigration status. And we're very proud of that fact. Um, some of the ways that we're going to start working on, uh, things that we're going to start working on is utilizing our employees more to spread the word that care is available at HHC facilities. We've got 36,000 plus employees spread over five boroughs. And a lot of those people can be goodwill ambassadors that can help us further expand um, our patient population. A lot of these folks, you know, very diverse ethnic backgrounds, speak a lot of different languages. Um, we're looking forward to utilizing them more so we can get the word out that people can come to us to receive low cost and no cost care. People are culturally competent and speak their language. Um, a little bit about our HHC options program. There are many similarities to what Daniel said for DC Alliance, but a couple of key differences. We're, this is not an insurance product per se. It's a, we do offer comprehensive health care services for folks who are not eligible for public health insurance. So we do a screen to make sure that they're, to see if somebody's eligible for Medicaid or Medicare or Child Health Plus or um, what we used to call Family Health Plus in New York State. And if they're not eligible for that, we <clears throat> enroll them into our agency options program, and they're fee scaled based on income, from you know anywhere from the cost of care of zero dollars up to charges. But most of our folks come into the categories where it would be we would consider um, level one or level level two, where they'd be looking at um, 
15 to 20 dollars for copays for everything that they need to get. Um, there's information on our website on HHC options, and uh, the website address is www.nyc.gov backslash HHC, and you can look at the options program there and get some ideas for there. We have it, I think, translated into 12 different languages. And we, you know, on any given day, we would serve um, folks who could speak more than 100 different languages. So we, we have it in all the major ones that comp, you know, that compose about 93% of our patient population. But we do have access to folks who can translate this um, and interpreters who can talk to folks in different languages. Um, I think uh, the, the other thing I wanted to mention, we do have an innovative program that we started a couple years ago called our Artist Access Program. So for artists, low-income artists who are uninsured, um, who are not eligible for public health insurance or um, want to enroll in this program, they can come in and if they're a musician, they can perform for our patients and we'll give them credits. If they're um, a visual artist, if they're a painter, they can you know, teach painting to our patients or paint murals in our hospitals. Um, I walked into one of our facilities the other day and there was a guy playing the trumpet greeting me. So all these, you know, at all our facilities, uh, people are there performing and they receive, uh, receive credits to pay for the care that, they, that we're providing to them. So we, um, in a few months from now, going back to our waiver, we're going to submit different um, waiver applications to the state. So if anybody's interested, check back in in six months' time, and we're going to talk about, we'll be able to talk more about what we're doing to partner with folks to increase access and reduce disparities. Right now, we're kind of in the middle of things, um, but I think we're going to have some very positive things coming forward. So I think that's all I have for today. Um, <laughs> we are next going to turn to Tangerine. We've been watching your questions as they come in, and there are there were some questions about My Health LA. So um, Tangerine will be addressing that as well as healthy San Francisco. And we just wanted to mention that some of the questions have reflected confusion. We are showcasing innovative programs that only are available in particular locations as an example of opportunity for policy advocacy. So these are not programs that you can enroll your clients in if you are out of a particular area. So let's turn it over to Tangerine. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Gabrielle, and uh, thank all of you for participating. So I wanted to give you a sense of two efforts that have occurred uh, in the state of California one in San Francisco and one we are launching in Los Angeles. Uh, I'll be talking about the San Francisco program called Healthy San Francisco because prior to coming to the Los Angeles Department of Health Services, I actually oversaw the Healthy San Francisco uh, program. So I just want to give you the context for why uh, San, City and County San Francisco went uh, down the route of access to care and what it found, at least in its first uh, six years of implementation. So uh, San Francisco was interested, and this was certainly before the Affordable Care Act, interested in expanding access to health care for the uninsured population. Uh, that population included the immigrant population. And it had actually done a community effort where it had determined really early on that expanding health insurance to the uninsured population was not financially doable and that we needed to look at a different model of care and we really needed to think about not so much uh, the financial aspects of insurance but really uh, the delivery system components and so we structured what's called a health access program was part of a an initiative and an ordinance at the local level but it essentially said that individuals who had income at or below 500% of the federal poverty level, um, irrespective of their immigration status or their medical condition, would have access to a comprehensive array of services. And really, our idea was trying to ensure that as much as possible, 
this population in terms of their utilization of healthcare services, that it would reduce episodic care, that we would give people a medical home, and that over time we would change health behaviors such that the utilization of health services in this population would resemble what we would see if these individuals were actually eligible for the Medi-Cal program, uh, which is California's version of Medicaid. And uh, we were able to actually do that uh, and prove that. So a little bit of the mechanics, and then I'll uh, talk about sort of you know, lessons learned and sort of the applicability in other communities. So um, we first, uh, it was really important for us to explain Ban the number of providers that traditionally cared for the uninsured population. We thought uh, very strongly that in addition to the Department of Public Health which, with its you know, acute care facility, its long-term care facilities, its behavioral health uh, services, its community-based clinics, and in addition our community-based FQHCs, that for us to really uh, expand access to care, we actually had to expand the number of providers that were actually interested in seeing this population, and we would not be able to wait for new facilities to be built uh, in the city. So one of the key features of Healthy San Francisco is that it actually expanded and attracted providers that would not normally participate in a program for the uninsured providing services to that population. So in San Francisco, Kaiser Permanente, which is you know, one of the largest HMOs in the state, participates. Uh, the largest private physicians group and, and another physician group participates. We have nonprofit hospitals that participate. So part of our effort in expanding access was expanding the number of providers serving this population. The other thing we did, and this was really an eye-opener, because we did not expand the number of facilities, um, if anyone's been to San Francisco, you know it is a small little town. <laughs> so, you know, you can't build out, you can only build up, and believe it or not, you know, no one wants to build up in San Francisco. Um, so we needed to figure out how to inform individuals about the services that were available to them. One of the things we found early on was that we had not done a job, a good job collectively, and when I say we, I mean the department and our community providers, giving people a sense of what resources were actually in the community. I mean, San Francisco is only seven by seven square miles, but we have seven acute care hospitals, a teaching facility, probably uh, over 25 or 30 clinics, and some large physicians groups. But people had no idea what services were available to them, how they could access them, the hours, language, and so we did a lot of work uh, making sure that the materials that we had were accessible to individuals. And the other thing was that we provided individuals with an identification card saying, you're healthy San Francisco, it says you're not insurance, but it had their medical home, it had their name, and people really responded to actually getting a card, letting them know that they were part of an organized system of care. We have member services, so if people want to complain because something isn't going well, uh, they can do that. So we actually structured a lot of the things. So we took some of the key features that you might see, either an insurance product or a managed care product, and overlaid them. And we got the responses that we want. One of the, um, we had Kaiser Family Foundation did a participant survey, and they found a 94% satisfaction rate amongst the people in the program. And more importantly, people felt financially secure because any fees that people would pay would be based on a sliding scale. And so we took into account individuals that had absolutely no income, they paid nothing, and then because we went up to 500% of the federal poverty level, people with higher incomes paid something. Um, uh, there are a number of other things about the program that it was tied in terms of financing. We wanted to ensure to the fullest extent possible that we had a diversified funding base. So the majority of the funding came from the county, but we also accessed and had uh, the ability to use uh, participant fees, although that was not a significant component of the program. And uh, because the Healthy San Francisco program um, was tied to what was called an employer spending requirement. I don't know if any of you have been to San Francisco lately and you've gone to a nice restaurant or even a so-so restaurant and on the bill at the bottom it says 
healthy San Francisco or employer spending requirement, you can blame me and blame everybody else that I work with. That's why you pay a little bit more on your restaurant tab. But those dollars go to fund uh, services for employees that are participating in our program. So we had a, a diversified funding base. Um, the director of health in San Francisco at the time, Mitchell Katz, uh, back in January 2011, he became the director of health for the Los Angeles uh, Department of Health Services. And when he actually became the director, he was really interested in uh, taking the sort of experiment that was done in San Francisco and trying to figure out sort of whether or not it was applicable in Los Angeles, and it certainly is. Obviously, the geography is a lot different, so there are challenges there, but the health status and conditions have not changed uh, at all, be it either in San Francisco or uh, Los Angeles. And so what we are doing in LA is creating a similar program, although the delivery system will focus uh, primarily initially in our first phase with our community uh, federally qualified health centers. So those health centers have been uh, strong participants and partners with the department uh, for many years, almost two decades, in providing health services to the uninsured. And we are working with them in crafting a program that would provide a medical home so people will select a primary care medical home that they can get services at to reduce uh, episodic care. Uh, it will not be insurance, however, uh, similar to the program uh, that John was describing in New York. Um, individuals will have access to primary care services and specialty services, uh, inpatient services, pharmacy, diagnostic, the, the full array of services, and referrals to uh, behavioral health, both uh, mental health and um, substance abuse services. Uh, we will have a member services component. Uh, we will have other things that we believe will be important for this program to work well. So um, that's just sort of a synopsis, and uh, the program will be starting uh, in the fall. Let me say, in terms of lessons learned, because I, I realize that not everybody is in Los Angeles, San Francisco, DC, and New York. Oh my goodness, you mean there are places in between. So what is, I think, applicable? Number one, I think that we all recognize that healthcare delivery is local and that all, all, in all of our communities we have providers who are delivering services to this population. And one of the key things is how to rally and corral, as you might say, those providers uh, and get their interest in uh, participating in a different delivery system. It does not mean necessarily building new clinics and new facilities for this population. I think the second um, we can provide information that is accessible to the population. I am often surprised, even in Los Angeles, the extent to which individuals do not access services and in some instances, it really is they have no idea where services are, what services are available to them, and they particularly, if they're uninsured, have no concept of whether or not they will uh, come out sicker from that visit from the fee that they might have to pay uh, if they were to actually access care. And you know that does not require a significant amount of work on anyone's part to ensure that the information is readily accessible and available uh, to individuals. I would say the next uh, sort of lesson um, that we have learned is the importance of data. Uh, I uh, tend to be a very strong data junkie, and one of the things that we did in San Francisco, and certainly we'll be doing this in LA, is dispelling the notions about this population. How they utilize services, are they, you know, significantly higher utilizers, and I think we all know that generally the undocumented population is generally healthier uh, than uh, most U.S. born residents. And so this isn't an issue of a lot of pent-up demand, this isn't an issue of they're going to drive out our other paying populations, but really providing information on uh, the demographics of the population and their utilization of services has really helped dispel myths around sort of what we're trying to do at the local level, uh, at least in the two communities that I have uh, worked in. So let me just stop there, and uh, I'll turn it back over to uh, Governor.
Thank you so much. So we are going to wrap up now with a presentation from Betsy. Thank you, Gabrielle. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Betsy Abela Subillo. I'm the Health Policy Coordinator for the California Immigrant Policy Center. And I just want to um, start off by uh, thanking the NILC, the National Immigration Law Center, and the rest of the panelists uh, for, for um, having this uh, webinar and presenting some of the, the different models in, um, that are, that are uh, in place to provide uh, health care services for our immigrant communities. And um, there, uh, so next slide. So to begin, the California Immigrant Policy Center was founded in 1996. Uh, CIPC, as many of our partners in, um, uh, is known by, is a nonpartisan, nonprofit statewide organization. And we seek to inform the public debate and policy decisions in our state. And so we work with many of our different partners um, and to advance uh, many legislations that are affecting our state immigrants and their families. And we have three offices. We have an office in Los Angeles, in Oakland, and in Sacramento. Next slide, please. So what I will discuss today in my presentation, um, just to give all of you a, a road map, I'm going to just give you a, a short, uh, short and brief information on immigrants in the U.S. just to kind of give you some context of how many immigrants we're talking about, how many are undocumented in the nation, and how many are undocumented in California. Uh, after that, I'm going to talk about just the policy context, what, how has immigration reform and maybe of, and many of the California state uh, legis legislation that has been passed, how is that impacting our California marine communities? Um, and then what some of the, the opportunities um, and lessons learned from the implementation of Covered California and what we saw um, as challenges and barriers with um, California immigrants. And, um, and I will also discuss some of the state options for immigrant communities. Um, and then I'll end with SB 1005, which is the Health for All bill, and give you some inf uh, information on the Health for All campaign and how really this bill and the campaign can be a model for many other states to follow um, in making sure that every, every person has access to health care. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, immigrants in the U.S., how many are, uh, are there in the nation? There's approximately 11 million undocumented immigrants nationwide. In our state of California, there's about 2.7 million. Uh, and with that, and actually the state of California has the highest number of undocumented immigrants, um, followed by, uh, it, I may not be saying this, uh, in, um, uh, but it's, it's followed by Texas and Florida and other states who have a large population of undocumented immigrants. Uh, with that said, because California has a large population of undocumented people, we uh, tend to, we, we like to push for pro-immigrant policies and make sure that our immigrant communities feel welcome in our state. Um, however, there has been a very uh, an anti-immigrant um, climate in the, in the nation as, uh, as well as our state. Um, there has been more than 2 million deportations under uh, President Obama, and that ha is a high record number. There has, um, there has never been as many deportations under any other president but President Obama. Uh, what this does is that it creates fear and mistrust in immigrant communities. So when um, immigrant communities are going in to seek services or are enrolling um, their eligible children into covered California, there is a lot of fear and mistrust with those who are trying to enroll them into the services. Um, of course, they fear deportation. Um, if they expose themselves or they expose their status, they may be putting their whole family in jeopardy. Or um, if they have to present their identification, um, what kind of identification or, or paperwork would they need to provide, and is that putting the family in jeopardy? So there's a lot of fear and mistrust within the, um, those who are um, health advocates and those who are providing services. Next slide, please. So in relation to California, um, last year uh, we called it the year of the immigrant, and there was a lot of, uh, oops, I'm so sorry, um, immigration reform. I skipped the slide. So um, the last immigration reform proposal 
was S744. And I'm just going to briefly mention this. I'm not going to go through the whole proposal um, because there's a lot of information on there. But how this particularly affects uh, immigrant communities and those trying to seek health and public benefits, um, this was for the first time a proposal where bipartisan legislators came to the table um, and discussed ways to be able to provide a pathway for many immigrants to to become um, legal permanent residents, to become U.S. citizens. And so from that last immigration reform, there were many, many different pieces to it. Um, but one of the major pieces was this new category called, called, category called RPI, Registered Provisional Immigrants. And what RPI would do is that it would actually um, create a new immigrant category where an immigrant would have to wait anywhere from 13 to 15 years to qualify for any public benefits program. In California, it'll probably be a little bit less, um, considering that we are more generous when providing health and public benefits to our, our immigrants. Um, but what this means to our immigrant communities is that even if this bill, immigration reform, were to pass today, um, they would still find it very challenging in seeking health and public benefits. So because they would have to wait um, many years to try to get any kind of services through our Covered California or our Medi-Cal program here in California. Next slide, please. So um, this is what I was talking about. So in California, last year was called the, the Year of the Immigrant. We had many different uh, policy wins uh, that benefited our immigrant communities. Uh, interstate, just to give you two examples of two bills that we uh, that were passed and that actually eases the, some of the fear in our immigrant communities and provides further eligibility. Uh, one of them was the California drive, driver's license, AB60, that was introduced by um, the, a legislator, Alejo, and this uh, license for all really um, has been a, 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 um, a long fight for many advocates, um, more than a decade, where uh, people have, are in needs of driver's license to get to work, to go to school, and so this bill would provide an access to a driver's license for any Californian, regardless of the immigration status, and CIPC, uh, along with many of our partners, are working very closely to be making sure that this is implemented. And then the other example that we have is the Trust Act AB40, which sets a minimum standard to ensure that community members with low-level offenses are not held in local jails extra time for deportation purposes. And once again, CIPC is working with different partners on making sure that both of these policies are implemented. Next slide, please. So um, going into health, immigrants in covered California, um, this is kind of uh, lessons learned from our first enrollment period and what we saw and what many of our community members shared with us is that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of confusion and fear within mixed status families. Mixed status families are, are, are family units who may have multiple immigrant um, uh, immigrant statuses. So you may have a mom, dad that's undocumented, and you have may, may have children who are U.S. citizens or um, legal permanent residents. And so mixed status families have a lot of confusion about enrolling eligible members into covered California or their own eligibility for Medi-Cal here, uh, which is the, our state program uh, for Medicaid. So there's also a um, that our health care system is very complex. So we're talking about folks who have never participated in a health care system, maybe have never been insured. Um, and so learning a lot of these new uh, learning a lot about uh, the, our health care system and, and the out-of-pocket costs and deductibles is very new and foreign to a lot of people. So there was a lot of complex, um, a lot of confusion with that. And then um, going lastly, undocumented immigrants um, and individuals who are granted relief through DACA, so these are the DACA youth, are are not able to get purchase coverage through uh, through the exchange even at a full cost. So that's definitely a major challenge with our, our new, um, with implementing the ACA. Next slide, please. So the undocumented here in California uh, have a patchwork of county coverage. There are some counties who do offer some type of coverage, and we have other counties who don't. I mean, so what we, what many of us call, this is kind of band-aid care for the undocumented. Um, depending what county you live in, as an undocumented person here in California, you may see different kinds of services that you're, that you're able to access. And one of them is actually 
Fresno with their Medically Indigenous Services Program. And um, they actually have, um, as of last week, a judge just ruled that the program, the MISP, will not be providing services to the undocumented. And so this is a great loss and a great, um, it's heartbreaking to know that undocumented people in Fresno will no longer be able to get services through this program. Um, so, and, and there's many uh, different counties that also do not provide services. So what this means is that the undocumented may have, uh, may rely on, on emergency Medi-Cal or um, uh, charity care or um, some um, community clinics that are, do provide some type of services. And so lastly, um, there was a UC Berkeley report that came out before the implementation of the ACA. And I know many of you have probably seen these numbers, those that are in California, but there's an estimation that three to four million Californians will remain in, uninsured even after, after the full implementation of the ACA, and about one million of them will be undocumented Californians. Next slide, please. And so just to kind of give you a list of California programs available, uh, regardless of status, um, I highlighted emergency Medi-Cal and community clinics because um, this has been traditionally an avenue for undocumented people to seek care. Um, undocumented people uh, realize that they don't have access to health care services, so many of them prolong care or um, go in uh, to the emergency room to seek basic needs because that's the only type of care that they may be able to access in their county. Um, and then you have many of these programs that are also um, currently very vulnerable um, and, uh, and funding and, and, and access. Next slide, please. So going to Health for All, why is Health for All important? Why did I even talk about uh, what's happening in the counties and what's happening with undocumented people? Well, we know that about 1, 1 million, actually 1.4 to 1.5 million undocumented Californians will continue to remain uninsured. Though the state does provide some health care services, whether that's through county services or charity care or community clinics, um, some of them are limited scope. Um, they don't provide a comprehensive services. Um, they might be for some types of illnesses or some type of coverage. And so they also have duration. They have a time limit and people may have to um, also uh, uh, enroll again. And so we know that that's a great challenge for our immigrant communities who are already fearful coming in and, and applying for a program. And then some of the, like I mentioned before, some of the counties don't provide coverage to any of their undocumented population. So we know this is not enough. We need access for every Californian regardless of the immigration status. We know that when a healthcare system, our healthcare system works better when everyone participates and everyone is healthy. Um, we also know that emergency care treatment is very expensive and like I was mentioning, um, the care that undocumented people receive has been mostly emergency care and we know that's expensive and if we turn that some of that, that money and some of those services into more um, comprehensive or preventive services, we know that's better for our immigrant communities. Uh, we know that if we have healthy parents and the parents are able to get services, then we have thriving families. And the undocumented are also a major economic engine for California. They contribute to our state's revenue through their work and through their taxes. Um, so it, it, it's um, important to be including them in our health care system. And lastly, health is a human right. Um, we want to make sure that every Californian has, has a healthy life. They're able to spend time with their family um, and be healthy. Next slide, please. So lastly, I'm going to talk about SC1005. Um, this bill, the Health for All bill, it was introduced by Senator Lara uh, on February 13th. There was a press event on February 14th where many community members, advocates, and health providers were present in supporting the bill. We have a strong legislative support. Uh, we have more than 20 plus co-authors, and some of them are here on the slide. And that list of co-authorship continues to grow as we continue to advocate for this bill. Next slide, please. So what does the bill do? SB1005, known as Health for All Bill, will expand access to health care coverage for all Californians, regardless of the immigration status. So essentially, this would provide coverage to the undocumented populations here in California through two ways. One of them is providing full scope Medi-Cal to those um, low income Californians who meet the income requirements. And this would authorize enrollment in some of the Medi-Cal Medi program. 
which we know many of our undocumented populations would actually benefit from. But um, we also know that because of the income requirements, a lot of the undocumented Californian population will not be able to apply or qualify for Medi-Cal. So we, this bill also creates a mirror or parallel exchange where an undocumented California can um, purchase, go in through a covered California marketplace, purchase, uh, pick a plan, purchase a plan, um, and uh, receive premium subsidies and cost-sharing cost sharing deductibles um, eligible, eligible uh, for, those, uh, for those individuals who are eligible. Um, and then lastly, um, SB 1005 will, ins will ensure that everyone in our communities have access to quality and affordable health care. Next slide, please. Um, and so we, beginning in this campaign, what we started to do was a lot of mobilization. We realized that our immigrant communities were not aware of, the, of, um, their, of their services in their county, were not aware of um, this health for all fight and, and the bill, and many of them just wanted to share with us what it has, what it means to be undocumented and uninsured. So we created, um, we developed the Undocu Care Van, C A R E, where um, it was a, a state journey that was inspired by the Undocu bus. So the Undocu bus was an actual school bus that traveled throughout the state and nationwide to be able to advocate for bills like the Trust Act and driver's license. So um, inspired by that movement. We did our own undocumented caravan where we traveled over 600 miles to create awareness and advocate for this bill. Uh, we made five stops, one in San Isidro, Santana, Los Angeles, Pomona, and Fresno. And our final stop was in Sacramento on April 30th. Um, and April 30th, and, and I'll share it in the next slide, but um, we did make a stop, final stop in April 30th because that was the date that the bill was going to be heard in the Senate Health Committee. Um, in each of the stops, there was a town hall and press event or a community talking circle where we directly spoke with the community um, and many of them shared um, some of their experiences with not being able to access care. Next slide, please. And just to share some of the pictures, these are some of our pictures that we um, that we took while our inner journey. So the middle one is actually the van that we use, uh, where we uh, had about 10 to 15 people joining us in this journey. Uh, uh, we had town halls, different events where um, we just wanted to highlight this issue. And then on your right, that little precious little girl, uh, she's holding a band aid, and we, so we had uh, people take pictures with these huge band aids, kind of highlighting the, the type of care that undocumented people have in California, which is kind of this, this gap in coverage or this band-aid care. Next, next slide. Thank you. So where are we now with the bill? Well, the, like I mentioned before, um, the bill was heard in the Senate Health Committee on April 30th. And uh, we had a so the caravan traveled and ended on April 30th, and we had a, a huge rally in Sacramento in the um, steps where, we, um, where the caravan Ended, but also we were we were presenting testimonies and lots of people came to support the bill. Um, the bill moved from the Senate Health Committee with a 61 vote, and it was referred to the Appropriations Committee on May 19th. Um, unfortunately, the bill was actually sent to, to a suspense hearing, and then the suspense hearing was on May 23rd. And even more unfortunately, the bill was um, essentially held in suspense with an urgency provision, so there was an opportunity for two-thirds vote requirement to move the, the bill forward. And, you know, what we learned from this is that we actually created a lot of momentum and a lot of buzz around this issue. In fact, in the suspense hearing, the chair, um, which is Senator De Leon, um, actually stopped the, he, uh, he made a, a statement, and he did say that he supported this bill and he supported the policy, but that there wasn't enough offset of the cost to, build, to move the bill forward. So um, this is something that is not normally done in an appropriations hearing. So uh, we, we realized that we, as a community and as advocates, we're definitely making a great impact into moving this bill forward and really highlighting the fact that we're leaving 1.4 to 1.5 million undocumented immigrants um, out of care here in California. Next slide, please. So what can you do as an advocate? There's lots of ways to get involved. Um, you can work with advocates, you can work with CIPC and many of our partners and, um, you know, creating more visibility to this issue. You can join one of our community town halls and actions. 
In fact, this month of July, we're going to have several events this, mo this month um, in Oakland and Los Angeles to, to bring this information to the community. Um, you can share your story if you have a member or you have someone that would like to share their story of being undocumented and uninsured. We'd like to hear your story. And also, you can share this information um, in social media by hashtagging the Health for All and also FD1005. So if you're on Twitter right now and are hearing this presentation, um, you can definitely hashtag um, about this information, and that's the way we track some of the movement around this issue. Next slide, please. And just uh, lastly, if you have any questions regarding any of the information I provided or how to get more involved with the Health for All campaign, you're welcome to reach out to me or Ronald Coleman, which is our Government Affairs Manager. Um, and you can also visit our website for more information. Thank you, Gabrielle. Okay, thank you. Um, now we will be moving to questions and answers. So, um, Sorry, I'm changing the slide at the same time as I'm talking to you. Not a good idea. So as we were going through the presentations, questions came in for a question came in that I think is relevant to everyone, which is how did this initiative get started? So why don't we start with Danielle? Sure. So the DC Healthcare Alliance program is a safety net program that was established in 2001 for individuals who were ineligible for Medicaid. So at the time, it included the childless adult population, which is currently covered under the ACA. And so the height of the program, our enrollment levels were 2,000 individuals. We currently have 2,000 individuals in our childless adult category. And for us, it was leadership on from the executive level as well as legislature who supported the DC Healthcare Alliance program. So it was a commitment uh, on all ends to have this program as a part of the district and have essentially coverage for all district residents. Excuse me, my slide censored. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to start energy here, so excuse me. John? I have a siren going by me right now. Hold on a second. Okay. Third and living. Okay, I'm I'm back. So I forgot to say the uh, being in working in Lower Manhattan is very noisy over here. Uh, our program started many years ago, probably the mid to early 2000s, and similar to what Danielle said, uh, our goal was to get people in, into a program and let them participate in the program, um, even though it's not insurance, but they could still get care that way. And it was also a way for us to increase how many people um, participated in the process to see if they were eligible for public health insurance. Prior to this, we didn't really have great numbers on that, although we were seeing a lot of folks that we thought were eligible. So the um, one of the goals of the program was actually get them in, get them enrolled, and we've been pretty successful and have several thousand folks that's in it right now. Okay. Tangerine? Uh, for San Francisco, back in the late 1990s, the then mayor uh, actually created a countywide um, effort with representation from the provider community, from researchers, from labor, from business, and outlined a proposal to expand health care coverage. And since that time, the city and county of San Francisco has actually implemented unique programs for the uninsured. Uh, it started with in-home support services workers, then it went to kids, et cetera. Then uh, in 2006, the then mayor, our uh, state's lieutenant governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, actually called together a group of people to think about uh, what could we do for the remaining adult uninsured? And it was actually through that effort it created a piece of legislation. I don't think you would need a piece of legislation to do this, but a piece of legislation was actually uh, signed into law, the Health Care Security Ordinance, and that ordinance created the Healthy San Francisco program and the companion uh, employer spending requirement. Um, so, But the county has had a long history of providing care for the uninsured population. In Los Angeles, uh, the 
um, initiatives to rethink how uh, the department provides health care for the remaining uninsured. I think perhaps started back in 2011-12, it was certainly after the signing of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the department has always partnered with community partners uh, to provide services on really a fee-for-service basis, but to really rethink the program, that probably started uh, around 2011-2012, as I just indicated, and we're moving towards that direction now. Great. Betsy? Oh, I was on mute. <laughs> uh, so I think for, at least for the Health for All campaign, how this really initiated was the, well, there was a realization that we were leaving 1.4, 1.5 million undocumented Californians that are out of our health care system and that uh, many counties were moving towards not providing services for the undocumented. And so um, just out of the that that need and really the, the um, we really wanted to make sure that we would expand health care services to every Californian and that California has always been a model for leading the nation in pro-immigrant policies and so um, you know just just going from from last year um, passing the, the driver's license and passing the trust act and domestic workers bill and, and other pro-immigrant bills we wanted to make sure that we continue um, some of that work that, that California is known to do, right, to be a pro-immigrant state. And so um, we wanted to make sure that we included every Californian in, in, in this new era of health care um, by providing them Medi-Cal and, and, and access to a covered California exchange. Okay, great. Um, next, we, just, we have a question for everybody about um, what was the funding source or what were the funding sources for the different initiatives? And I know for SB 1005 we're working on that. But why don't we start with Tangerine? Uh, for Healthy San Francisco, the primary funding source is uh, local funds. Uh, the county, as I indicated before, has always been in uh, the business of providing health services for the uninsured. The next pot of funding is really um, funding from uh, employers who, in order to meet the employer spending requirement, select Healthy San Francisco to provide that for their employees. Uh, and then the final funding source are uh, participation fees for those participants um, who must pay a fee to remain in the program. In terms of the distribution of those funding sources, I would say probably 75 to 80, you know, definitely at least 80 percent is local. Um, less than 5 percent comes from uh, participants and the difference around 10 percent, maybe 15, uh, comes from employers who have selected it to participate in the program. In terms of my Health LA, the program we're developing in Los Angeles, as I indicated, the first phase is with our community partners, and that funding um, is solely county funding uh, for that program. Okay, and we also had a number of questions about what people mean when they talk about local funds. Okay, so local funds for uh, Los Angeles and for San Francisco are essentially uh, uh, tax dollars. So, you know, every locality you know, has what are called general fund uh, dollars, which are a combination of fees and taxes, and those dollars are allocated across various departments, be it either, you know, child welfare, park and rec, uh, libraries, public safety, and health. And uh, both in Los Angeles and San Francisco, a portion of those general funds have been uh, allocated to help fund services for this population. Thank you. Danielle? So for the district, it's 100% local funds. So there are district funds that are part of the fiscal year budget each year. It's a line item and it's funded through tax dollars um, and from citizens, so that's how we support the program. As I stated in the slides, we can't claim any Medicaid, 
um, funds or FFP, so it's 100% local for us. Okay. And John? In New York, uh, most of the dollars to the program would come through federal disproportionate share hospital payments that flow through New York State to us. HHC is the largest hospital recipient of DISH funds in the, the country. And looking at our budget right now, we've got about $893 million projected for fiscal year 15 in disproportionate share hospital funds. It doesn't cover all the costs, but it uh, is a good chunk of the cost for the care that we provide to uninsured folks. Okay. And Betsy, do you want to say anything about the current funding sources being contemplated for SB 1005? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll share shortly um, about for SB 1005. So you, um, the, so one of the, obviously that was the major challenge in when we were and uh, when we went to the appropriations committee. But um, for we were. So we were trying to offset, and we're in the process of offsetting a lot of that cost, at least on the Medi-Cal piece, as well as looking at um, the offset costs on the parallel exchange piece. But um, we, there's actually a really great report that the UC, UC Berkeley Labor Center and the UCLA Health Policy Research Center um, developed last month um, where you can actually find it at the UC Berkeley Labor Center website where they actually did a policy brief on the offset cost or look analyzing at the cost of Medi-Cal for SB1005 and some of the ways that we can offset the cost. And from that brief, we, there were, we actually realized that we can actually provide Medi-Cal for the undocumented Californians if we just um, add two additional pennies to every dollar that we're currently spending for Medi-Cal. So these are just two more pennies that we're, we can just uh, make sure that, that our communities, every community in California is healthy, right, and that we're not excluding folks because they don't have uh, they don't have paperwork or their legal status. And so um, there was other multiple ways that we were offsetting the cost, and obviously we're going back to the drawing board and figuring that out. But um, if folks, if, if any of, of you are interested, um, maybe the, uh, you can definitely check out the, the UC Berkeley um, uh, policy brief. It's, I think it's called A Little Way, a little bit goes a long way, um, and you can check it out on their website. All right, and then we've also received a series of questions about what the future is looks like for these programs in the post Affordable Care Act world. Who still enrolls? Are people who are eligible to the exchanges able to use them? And how does that affect the sustainability of the funding sources? And let's start with John for that one. Can you, it was a little choppy, can you say the question over again for me? Okay, sure. The question was about the future of the programs post-ACA. Who's still enrolled? Um, are people who are eligible for the exchanges able to participate in the program? And what are the implications for the funding sources? Okay, so if you are eligible for public health insurance, you're not eligible for HHC options. Um, the program will continue because as we, we know, there, there are folks who are not going to be eligible for public health insurance under the ACA. So we're still going to have a program and we're still going to operate it going forward. But if you are, if we, when we're sitting down, our financial counselors are going through the applications, if they are eligible for Medicaid, then they're not eligible for HHC options. Okay. And um, so is that also true for people who are able to get coverage through the exchanges? Correct. If you're eligible for your insurance, uh, you can use, if you are underinsured, if, if you have a plan that doesn't cover a lot of services, if you are underinsured, then you can um, get HHC options. But because Medicaid pays for so many things in New York, that we are, you're, you're excluded from options if you're on Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and do you want to comment on the, how the sustainability of the funding source is affected by the ACA? Say the question again. It was a little choppy. How does the delay of? Okay. Uh-oh. Okay. How <laughs> 
Um, the sustainability of the funding source might be affected by the ACA. So, for example, you mentioned that the program is funded by DISH, but yeah, we know that DISH funding will be going down. Yeah, this, that's going to be a big problem for HHC because it's our uh, we run we have a structural budget deficit that right now is about two hundred million dollars and it ramps up to one point three billion in four years. Uh, as the coverage uh, Congress used the dollars for the disproportionate share hospital funding dollars. They largely used those dollars to pay for the increases in coverage when they adopted the ACA a couple years ago. So we're looking at a big drop-off in funding in um, 2017, federal fiscal year 2017-2018, that we can start to see the bottom fall out for DISH funding for HHC. And over the course of 10 years, we could lose more than $2.6 billion. Um, luckily, our congressional delegation has been very supportive, and so far we've had two years of DISH cuts pushed back. So. Our hope is that we can continue to push back against these cuts and then maintain our, you know, impress upon the Congress about the importance of uh, the need for continued DISH funds because DISH funds were used as a, a means to cover the shortfall for what Medicaid paid and then what we got for uninsured. Since we're still going to have a sizable uninsured population in New York that's not going to be covered, we still need those funds. But Luckily, our congressional delegation has been great on this. Hopefully, we can continue to push this back every year, but it's a big threat moving forward. Okay. Kadrine, do you want to take that? Uh, so um, let me just say in uh, both San Francisco and Los Angeles, the idea is that uh, the program is not a substitute for health insurance. It's really designed for individuals who uh, are ineligible for publicly supported health care. So uh, really what we anticipated, and this certainly bears uh, true, is that there are fewer people who are eligible for both of those programs and both of those communities because uh, to a large extent those individuals who have been eligible for uh, Medi-Cal have been enrolled in Medi-Cal or if they're eligible for Covered California have been told about Covered California and elected to enroll during the open uh, enrollment uh, period. Uh, because, uh, at least in these two communities, uh, there is a recognition that uh, coverage should be available irrespective to the immigration status. I don't believe that we will be confronting issues of, of um, uh, issues of uh, concerns that the funding that we currently have in the program is being inappropriately used for its intended purpose. So I think that uh, both of those communities, um, I'm not in San Francisco anymore, but as I understand, they're going forward with continuing to provide uh, funding for the program, recognizing that the program is serving fewer people. Is that okay. helpful? Yes, thank you. And Danielle? So for, uh, for the Alliance program, over the years, as I said in our earlier response, that it started in 2001, and we had a huge budget for the program. But because 35,000 folks transitioned to Medicaid under the ACA, it's a smaller population. But we have commitment from the executive as well as our legislature to continue the program. We understand the need for it. We also have a strong advocate community. And we are the often testify for the need to fund the program and to continue to have the program as part of the district and in the district for district residents. Okay. Um, just drilling down a little bit more on the sources, we have had a question. There's a question that's come in about whether the local programs are wrapping around emergency Medicaid services. Well, I can speak to that. Okay. This is open, right, Gabrielle? Do you have an order? I'm sorry. Yes. I think. Do you want it to go in order? I can. I can clearly. I no. Can... Anybody who okay. that question? That's fine. So, for the district, uh, we use our emergency Medicaid program, that program, 
for emergency hospital visits. So if a person is an alliance beneficiary, then it's carved out of our managed care plan. And if you are admitted into the hospital, then we've informed the providers to directly bill DACF. And we would use emergency Medicaid to pay for that. The other services are part of the MCO packet and plan. And so that's how they would follow up with um, you know, ambulatory care or any other services that are needed. But we do essentially wrap around in, a, in, in somewhat in a similar way to the question. OK. Does anyone else want to comment on that? I think it was. Uh, in uh, San Francisco and uh, Los Angeles, I mean, um, individuals who would be enrolled in our program, but they would still be eligible for emergency Medi-Cal because emergency Medi-Cal only covers an episode, but we recognize that people will need health care services outside of that episode. So we would certainly use emergency Medicaid uh, to bill when appropriate um, for those services, but the individuals would continue to be enrolled in our program. Great. And John, I heard you. Yeah, um, pretty much ditto what Tangerine said. It's for, you know, it's for episodes. If you're an inpatient, we would use it to cover when you're an inpatient. For outpatient services, we could get emergency Medicaid to cover certain services. The rest of them we would provide through whether or not the person enrolled in agency options or not. We would still continue to provide those other services that are needed. Um, Betsy, did you want to say something about the strategies for wrapping around the limited scope funding for SB 1005? Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to, to once again point out that uh, a lot of the access for undocumented people and has been emergency care, at least here in California, which, was, which is what I can speak to, is that that has been the, the avenue or the door for many of our undocumented families who are seeking care. So I think it's important to acknowledge that emergency care has been traditionally very important for immigrant communities, but it's not enough, right? Um, we know that, that a lot of our families do need more comprehensive services. They have special, they need special care or may need just preventive services that, um, um, just to make sure that, that they don't get, you know, they don't get sick or they don't have, uh, or their illness doesn't um, deteriorate. And so, you, um, that's, so in regards to SB1005, um, what we would like to do is make sure that we, that we provide full scope Medi-Cal for undocumented Californians um, and that they're able to um, get the same services and the same care that any other Californian has. And of course, there's an income requirement of 138% of the federal poverty level, so we want to make sure that that for those individuals um, that, that they, they still have to meet the income requirement. But um, with the bill, we, like, uh, we do want to provide full scope Medi-Cal. Right. And if you don't mind me clarifying what I meant, um, oh. in, the UC, in the UC Berkeley study that Betsy mentioned before, one of the funding strategies that's being looked at is whether there's a way to continue to receive the federal matching funds that we get now for providing limited scope Medicaid services to the population that would be provided full scope under SB 1005 to offset the cost of providing the services. Yes, you're, you're correct. Sorry, I, I, I didn't quite understand your question. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we are definitely looking at some of that federal, uh, some of that money that goes into emergency care to be able to offset that cost. Um, you know, and we know that, that if, uh, like I said, emergency care is very expensive and there's very creative ways to be able to to make sure that, that we can maybe turn that around and make sure that we're providing uh, preventive services to uh, undocumented Californians. Okay, great. And then um, we've had some questions about essentially recommendations or lessons learned about the most effective outreach and education strategies about the program. So let's start with John for that one. I knew you were going to call me first. <laughs> uh, Actually, if I could defer to one of my other panelists, let me let me go back and think about what our lessons learned are. Okay, Danielle, can you are you ready for that? Sure, I am. Uh, in terms of our lessons and outreach to the community, we are pretty. We have a very strong relationship with our advocates as well as our community-based organizations. 
So they're very familiar with the program. We have meetings with them once a month. Um, they are very involved uh, politically with um, reaching out to the mayor's office as well as our council members. And pretty much that's how we get the word out. Um, and we also have it in our schools and information you know, throughout the community. So it's a, it's a known uh, program in D.C. and we um, are continuing to move forward with the program. Okay. Um, Kendry? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just echo some of the things Danielle said. I mean, obviously, first it starts with you know, understanding who's trusted by the community you're trying to serve. It's, it's the undocumented individuals or the broader uninsured population. So the first thing we did was to first get a sense of who those trusted individuals are. We spent a lot of time making sure in terms of outreach that, the, as I said before, the materials were uh, to a level where individuals could sort of use them, understand them, those kinds of things. Also in San Francisco and also in this uh, community, um, we have what's called 311. And you'd be surprised, I think it started in Chicago, which is, you know, you can call 311 for anything to figure out either how to get the pothole fixed or complain about public transportation. It was a gateway for us to communicate about uh, at least the availability of Healthy San Francisco in, in the San Francisco area because we did not spend money on um, marketing and outreach. We uh, made a conscious decision, quite frankly, that to the fullest extent possible, we wanted to uh, spend dollars on health care services. So we really tried to use existing um, outreach mechanisms uh, to do that. We created a really uh, consumer-friendly website with everything on it. We had information uh, in uh, the three primary languages in San Francisco. In fact, the largest immigrant population in San Francisco is Chinese-speaking. And so we had our website, you know, you could click it, it was in Chinese. All of our we had materials in Chinese. And the next uh, population uh, in terms of people of color is Latino. And so we had everything in Spanish, our application, um, our assisters. Um, we had newsletters that were in those languages so that when people, after they enrolled in the program, they felt connected to the program because we were sending the materials in their language and all of those kinds of things that we did uh, to facilitate. And we did tons of presentations within the community before we launched uh, to make sure that people were aware of the program what it offered, and how people could enroll. Great. So, John, are you going to tackle that now? Yeah, yeah and, and luckily, I, when I was uh, had you on mute, another couple of sirens just went by. Um, <laughs> life in New York City. The, I, I think what Danielle and Tangerine were saying, I agree 100% with, that trust is a big issue, and establishing trust within uh, immigrant communities and establishing like, strong links linkages with community-based organizations who represent um, significant immigrant populations. Um, but also having culturally competent care and being able to provide care in languages that people are most comfortable communicating with. Uh, we've, we've seen um, spikes in types of patients coming to our facilities because of one provider speaking a particular language. Uh, and then over time, the word gets out community that if you speak Polish, go to Woodhull Hospital. There's a you know provider there that can speak your language. And then people feel more comfortable uh, doing that. But trust and communication are definitely big, big issues for us. And the last thing is that we have each one of our hospitals, we have community advisory boards. Uh, we're statutorily required to have them. ADC, the Public Benefit Corporation, when we were created by law, they created community advisory boards. And we're required to have uh, patient representatives, community representatives, um, and also employee representatives on them. And we have great working relationships with our community advisory boards. And most of these people are also very active in their local community boards, active with their elected officials, active with their CEO. So we, every month, meet with them and describe what we're doing and seek their support and seek their assistance in getting the word out on things. So um, trust, trust. Communication 
information, more trust, you know, things that, that you can never go wrong, um, talking to people and developing linkages with them. Okay. Betsy, do you want to add anything generally about outreach and education strategies that you found effective? Yeah, I mean, I think particularly for the undocumented, um, or the, I would say the immigrant community, um, just as the other panelists ha have said, um, that you, you really need to build a trust uh, within the immigrant communities. And to be able to build that trust, you do need uh, partnerships with organizations that um, have worked with those families or those individuals, such as the community clinics or some of the charity care organizations or um, even some of the, the local um, organizations that, that provide education, so that may be like a nonprofit or um, a, a student group. Even I would even say go, you can go further and, and build partnerships with immigrant youth organizations, such, such as the, the student groups or even the, like the, here in Los Angeles, you have the Dream Team Los Angeles, the LA um, Los Angeles Immigrant Youth Coalition, so really looking at um, going further and looking at other possible partnerships you may have with other immigrant groups and, and also realizing that um, the immigrant communities are going to come with you with a lot of fear and a lot of confusion. So what can you do as an advocate or as, a, um, as an organizer or as someone who provides direct services, what can you do to ease that fear? So you may want to make sure that you are well prepared um, and you're well prepared and are know this information to answer any questions that undocumented people may have. I mean, I think just being on this webinar already has you're 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 going in the right direction to make sure you have the tools and the resources available to be able to answer any questions that immigrant communities may have. Okay. That's right. I'm still on the call. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Um, the screen of my screen just completely changed. So that is pretty much all the time we have. I apologize to the people whose questions we weren't able to answer. Two questions that came in um, in various forms were, is this webinar going to be available on your website? Yes. It will be available on our website, milk.org. We will also email a link to everyone who registered. And then there were also requests for a webinar that would be more relevant to the needs of people who were trying to determine immigrant eligibility and do enrollment for people in the exchanges or under the ACA. And there is a link to, there are links to both California-specific and national webinars on those topics on our website. So again, I went to Thank everyone so much, especially our presenters, and especially our presenters on in East Coast time who were with us until 5.30. So um, again, thank you for your participation, and we look forward to further dialogue on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.